Hello and welcome to another episode of the Space Update, part of the fantastic Total Space Network. I'm your host Ryan and joining me today is my wonderful co-host. I'm Mick, the host of Deep Dive Fridays. Today we're kind of carrying on from previous episode, speaking with Skyro, talking about suborbital rockets and we'll be talking about Sentinel-6 and other space news as chosen by our Patreon supporters. But first, the news. Okay, so up first on the news, uh, Crew-1 uh, launched and arrived at the International Space Station. And more interestingly, just recently, China have launched a moon sample return mission, Chang'e 5, I believe. I'm absolutely buttering that name. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong over on Twitter, you know. Uh, this one will be the first time a sample return mission has been done since what year, Miko? A, 1974. B, 1975, or C, 1976? I'm going to go with B, 1975. Is that your final answer? <laughs> it's 1976. <laughs> Damn. Uh, did you watch the launch live of Chang'e 5? That one, no, I'd, I'd missed that one, but uh, I watched it back over on YouTube. Incredible launch of that one. There was lots of uh, camera footage of that one, wasn't there? Yeah, a lot of great camera footage there was footage from the flame trench that was a pretty good camera shot and also the state separation and satellite separation was great yeah yeah and those uh views from the flame trench uh, likes of tim dodd over on every astronaut we was absolutely amazed by all those views of the flame trench who's straight on twitter asking if elon with the falcon 9 launches can he uh can we have some views i imagine that that would be absolutely fantastic to see Fal falcon 9 take off and views from the pad in a different angle and everything yeah that would be great to see but i bet those cameras will be dead after one launch yeah yeah and rolling on with some more news, uh, Global Science have been dealt a crippling blow as a keyboard radio tes telescope, one of the biggest in the world up until uh, recently, um, is set to close due to it being damaged beyond repair. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but uh, I don't know if you saw that one, Miko. Um, badly damaged and a load of uh, bad weather and everything, but going to have to take it down and everything because it's that far beyond repair. They're just going to have to uh, literally, it's not worth fixing, so it'll just take millions to uh, repair it. And it's 50 odd years old. Yeah, that was sad news. After the first blow, I was thinking they are going to fix it, but now with the second one, it doesn't seem to happen anymore. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame, really, because there's a few guys uh, that have uh, messaged me online saying uh, they were involved and used to use that satellite for a bit of their work that they carry out in the previous years and everything. So a lot of people have a lot of connections with that telescope and everything. Yeah, and I believe it was one of the biggest telescopes before China made their... Yeah, up until recently, China, like you say, yeah, they've got a, a bigger one now. Um, we've also had some uh, news from Rocket Lab, their 16th launch, Return to Sender. Successful booster recovery, and Peter Beck's actually mentioned, rather than going for the capture with the booster in midair, they might actually proceed in with some more landings of the booster in the actual sea before they uh, proceed with the helicopter capture is quite interesting. But despite that, he said all the tests were successful. Yeah, I'm waiting for Peter Beck to eat his hat. Yeah, he's, uh, he keeps mentioning, everyone's uh, bugging him now about that. <laughs> and we've also, uh, on the previous episode, as we talked, um, Skyrora's third stage vacuum engine successfully completed testing for their XL rocket. Check out our previous episode where we chat with them on that. We've also got a bit of news on Astra. Um, they're set to take its second orbital launch attempt. Fingers crossed for the team on that one. And we've got some more news on Firefly as they're uh, gearing up for their first launch of the Alpha rocket very, very soon. And just for the hell of it, just uh, throw this in here. Uh, there's still no update on Enrol 44 with that uh, Delta Heavy. I joked that it wouldn't launch until next year, but it seems it'll be heading that way. What's your prediction, Miko? I mean, there's still time, but with the Christmas coming and all, I think it's going to be early next year. Yeah, yeah, I think that rocket's absolutely plagued with problems from what it seems more than we actually know. Yeah, seems like it. And finally, we've had confirmation of uh, rogue closure for serial number eight uh, for SpaceX down at Boca Chica for that 15k hop. 
Uh, it's provisionally penciled in for the 30th of November, 1st of December and 2nd of December. 10 hour launch window on each day, first day 7am till 5pm and the other two days 8am till 6pm local time. We are doing a static fire because we have that engine swap over. So fingers crossed that goes all okay. That's actually happening as we record right now and then probably proceed with the uh, hop just early next week. Yeah, can't wait to see that flight happen. All right, Miko, I'd like to kick things off uh, this week, just our general topic discussions, as we always do, by following on from our chat with Skyrora last week, talking about um, suborbital rockets. In particular, um, we, I'd like to look at Astra and Firefly this week. Both new companies are entering the ring and launching payloads into low Earth orbit and beyond. Firefly, their down headquarters down in Austin, Texas, uh, committed to providing economical and convenient access to space for small payloads, similar to Skyrora and all the other there in Rocket Lab, but uh, a lot of competition in the suborbital payload category at the moment, isn't it, Miko? Yeah, the small set launchers are popping everywhere. I don't think there will be place for too many more. Yeah, I mean, a lot of companies are um, getting into it now, because it's that first step towards a launch capacity in their country, really. I mean, obviously, the likes of Russia, America and Central Europe to a certain extent through the European Space Agency. They are have, already have their larger rockets, if you like. They've already been through that stage of smaller rockets and built their way up. So they're a good fair way ahead. Yeah, definitely. But I think with Rocket Lab, there could be like two more small sat launchers that could actually be profitable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, jumping back to um, Firefly, when I started looking into them, there's a hell of a lot more to them than I initially thought. We've seen a lot of news on their Alpha rocket that's being constantly testing, engine testing, everything else. It's likened to a mini Falcon 9. I don't want to compare it too much to that because it's, it's not a Falcon 9 at the end of the day. But the shape of it is reasonably similar if anyone's seen it there. It's about 30 metres high, This uh, the Alpha rocket. And it's going to be capable of lifting to around about... 1,000 to 4,000 kilograms, which is quite a decent size, really, for the uh, the size of the rocket. The launch price is starting from around 15 million, which I think might be giving Rocket Lab a run for the money on that. Yeah, Rocket Lab is around 6 million for a launch, but also their payload is around 300 kilos, so this is quite a bit bigger launcher. Yeah, so for double your money, you're getting an awful lot more capacity, really. Once I start looking into uh, Firefly, I've read a ton on the Alpha rocket, but when obviously looked on the Firefly website, eventually you got the uh, obviously got Alpha, their main rocket, and you got Beta, the heavy style rocket, which is essentially a bit like your Falcon Heavy, essentially just strapping an extra two core boosters to the side of it. I don't know if you've seen it, Miko, the uh, the payload at the top of that one's a bit peculiar rather than having the essentially the fairing on the top of can't describe it. Really. No, I actually haven't seen it. It looks really, really bizarre. The, rather than the what you call chamfering in, where the nice just it just tapers in, and then you've got the straight body rocket. It essentially goes from really wide to really thin gradually as it goes down the rocket. It looks it looks top heavy. It looks absolutely bizarre. If you if you just search for Firefly's Beta Heavy style rocket over on their website, you'll see it's not your standard fair and put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> As well, as well, they've got their Gamma project, which is actually they're similar to like, like the, the likes of the shuttle. It's going to be like their own um, crew vehicle of some sort, but very little information out there on that at the moment. I'll have to do a bit dig, a bit more digging and bring that to uh, the deep dive episode that you run. Yeah, that could be one great topic. I just actually checked out the Beta Heavy launcher. As you said, it looks quite top heavy. Yeah, very bizarre looking one. Uh, if, if you're listening, go and check that one out. Firefly as well, they've got their Genesis uh, Moon Lander, so I'm completely unaware of this one. I snuck under the radar a little bit there. Just a little mini Moon Lander, I imagine. Little small experiment payloads to the moon, that one. Um, it's quite a small rocket, so it just it's quite surprising that such a small rocket could actually send payloads to the moon. But then again, you look at Rocket Lab and they're looking at doing the same sending uh, payloads to Venus and beyond, really, with just a little 30-meter rocket. Yeah, it's great to see that. Do you know if the Moonlander Genesis has any contracts already? 
Not that I'm aware of um, initially. I mean, I've just stumbled across this one myself, um, so I'll put throw my hands up out there. Very little information on that one as of yet, but as soon as I find some, I'll uh, bring it onto you, onto here. Yeah, excited to see where it goes. And as well as that, they've got um, their orbital transfer vehicle, or OTV as they like to call it. Um, I've read a bit into this. It's actually quite similar to Rocket Lab's Photon um, bus, if you like, where they just essentially, science experiments can just be mounted on top of Rocket Lab's satellite bus, if you like, and the science experiments, they don't have to worry about propulsion, power, or anything else, which is quite interesting that uh, they're considering that, considering Rocket Lab have already kind of beat them to it. Yeah, that actually seems to be similar even to Sky Rora's upper stage, the Leo stage. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, there are quite a few guys following on. I mean, Rocket Lab's done it first. Um, I'm surprised SpaceX haven't done something similar, creating like a satellite bus of some sort to provide power and everything else to other people's little experiments and uh, CubeSats and everything else. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see that from SpaceX. Yeah, yeah. And another company that I'm quite excited for, Astra. Um, Astra's uh, got another launch coming up very, very soon. Um, as we saw just a few months ago, their very first, um, well, not the very first flight, but their flight of their serial number three family of rockets, um, done a test flight. Smooth launch, but uh, very quickly, I think things went sideways with that. Um, not too much information as such on that, but um, so fantastic videos of that. Uh, I think the launch actually went off course a bit, so they had to stop the launch and it just fell to the ground after violating the launch area. Yeah, yeah, they made that announcement, but when you watch the videos back, it looks like the rocket just becomes completely unstable to a certain extent, which maybe it did go off off course to the point where it's just uncontrollable. You, you see it start to wiggle and, wiggle and all sorts of, as it starts getting higher and higher. Although they said it's gone off course, it looks like they've just lost control of it, basically. So something's gone awry there. Yeah, they probably lost control first and then it went off course. Did you see those those footage from the ground? Some people actually were quite close to the explosion. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. That was incredible to see. I wouldn't like to get that close to a test uh, a test rocket, like especially uh, as, as fantastic as they are. Because you just don't, don't know what what's going to happen at any time. <laughs> yeah, totally. Especially Starship and SM4. Yep, those are a bit bigger. Just a little bit, you know. But um, to going on Astra a little bit more, um, they're a large vehicle company based over in uh, California, uh, incorporated just on, in 2016, so not too long ago, considering the launching rockets uh, this year, in the space of four years. But... Um, Astra themselves have got a lot of experience under their belt. They've got um, a previous SpaceX engineer, a bunch of guys from MIT. Um, so they look like they've got uh, a lot of wealth of experience under their belt to uh, essentially hit the ground running. Yeah, the company could have a bright future. Uh, but even though there was some news that they might be running out of money, at least if the new 3.2 rocket won't work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they got a, a, a lot of funding because they were involved with the uh, DARPA competition, which was for commercial companies to build up at launch vehicles. But they were not able to complete a successful launch in time to claim the award, apparently. But whether they got some of that funding still through to carry them over, I'm not really sure, 100%. But the Rocket 3 is a family of 11.6 metre launch vehicles, so quite a small rocket really compared to some of the others out there. And um, has a payload capacity of just 25 to 150 kilograms to a 500 kilometre sun-synchronous orbit. So it's quite a small rocket when considering when you look at the likes of Rocket Lab and what Firefly are attempting to do. Yeah, it's a bit smaller and when comparing to Rocket Lab, they have one more thing similar. The Astra rocket has electric pumps also, just like Rocket Lab. Yeah, yeah. So like, again, as battery technology advances, so will the power to that rocket. As we've seen with Rocket Lab recently, upgrade their payload capacity by, albeit a few kilograms. A few kilograms just makes all that difference in what you can actually carry and deliver into space. Yeah, that's especially true with the small vehicles. 
a few of their uh, launches actually uh, back in 2018. Um, although they had a few launches and everything, uh, Astra stated that they were both successful d- despite there being some dispute that they actually failed. But um, that's all up for debate, that. But it was quite spectacular seeing that uh, that rocket exploding on impact when it came down. But um, it seems there have uh, got a few guys on board for this uh, next launch coming up in the next month or so. I think it's quite brave. Companies putting their payloads on an experimental rocket just after they've seen it smash into the ground previously. So <laughs> bit of a questionable one there for me. Yeah, definitely. And circling back to the older launches, I think they said they were successful because they actually got some data, not that they actually got to orbit or even suborbital heights. Yeah, yeah. And this this rocket again is using the general mix of uh i believe rp1 and locks i believe so correct me if i'm wrong but uh seems to be the uh the go-to for everyone starting up lately yeah it's a good fuel mixture to use reliable and known and the um in, in comparison i think the skylark l that sky are doing it is pretty much the same size or slightly bigger than astra so we'll see a, a little in competition going on with them too eventually um because uh, as we when we were speaking with robin from sky Aurora, uh, the skylark l's actually going to be launching within the next next year fingers crossed so we can hopefully see some exciting uh, launches here here over in the uk and a little bit a little bit closer to you Miko, but not quite uh within view yeah, I mean, UK is so close that I might actually come to watch the launch. Yeah, we all need to get together, don't we? We all speak on this podcast, spread apart across the country and the world and everything, but we'll have to all meet once this crazy thing that's happening in the world disappears. Fingers crossed. Yeah, that could work. Road trip. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, hoping you're enjoying the show so far. If you'd like to support what we're doing and join our Discord community, head over to patreon.com forward slash total space. Once you're signed up, you'll have full access to exclusive content, interviews and access to previous episodes. That's patreon.com forward slash total space. Let's get back to the show. Okay, so we're going to jump on to uh, the recent launch of Sentinel-6 uh just happened recently uh, on a Falcon 9 rocket. Um, that one launched from uh, Vandenberg, I believe. A bit of a peculiar launch, that one. Not sure why it was from that area. Um, but the Sentinel-6 program includes two identical satellites. Uh, one's obviously just launched in the Falcon 9, which you've just seen. And the next one will launch in five years' time, um, which will be Sentinel-6B in 2025. That one will launch. These satellites will measure sea level changes, which have been measured without interruption since 1992. Uh, Sentinel-6A, the first one that's just up there in space now, was renamed on January 20th, 2022, uh, in honour of former director of NASA Earth Science Division, Michael Fraley, who was uh, instrumental, I'll get it right eventually, in advancing space-based ocean measurements. Um, quite an interesting satellite, this, because it's, um, it's replacing some old um, technology and these will be running for a good 20 to 30 years and they're quite important, really, especially right now with climate change and everything that's going on. Yeah, it's good to see NASA and actually ESA cooperating with these kinds of missions to have at least a decade more of watching the sea level rise. And circling back to the launch site, they launched from Vandenberg to south so they can go to the polar orbit. Uh, They theoretically could have done that from Cape Canaveral, but they have only launched one mission from there to the polar launch orbit. That was the SAOCOM satellite. Yeah, yeah, that was a polar orbit as well, wasn't it? Um, Just a slightly different orbit a bit unusual but uh well within the capability of the falcon 9 and everything um the thing that stuck with me was this this payload was only 1.2 tons and falcon that that's well well within falcon 9's ability so that's probably why we sort of uh, land back at uh at the base or on land if you like falcon 9 probably just easily pushed that into space without very little effort i'd be surprised that uh, spacex barely put any fuel in in that um, to actually get it into war because it's so light. Yeah, that's very true. I think they could do the return to launch site with a five-ton payload even. I mean, if they hadn't done that, they wouldn't have the drone ship uh, on that side of the ocean. 
Yeah, yeah, and we've had some, uh, just to jump into some other news as well, with the, uh, we were talking earlier on about the telescopes and everything. Um, it's quite a big and important thing, really, that uh, telescope going out of, out of action, really, because um, I know there's lots of plans in the future to build uh, new and bigger and better telescopes. As, uh, as we mentioned before, China's now crown of uh, the biggest telescope in the world and everything, but uh, there's quite a few more in uh, production and everything. Yeah, I think there's quite a few in production. So there's a lot of exciting uh, space telescopes um, getting launched fairly soon, but the James Webb Telescope, I actually messaged the, messaged the guys over on uh, Twitter and the uh, asking them what their first point of uh, observation will be because uh, there was a big release earlier on about uh, finding planet orbit and uh, a dwarf, white dwarf uh, star and everything. A lot of uh, media around that, so I just pinged it straight over to the guys at NASA and the guys in charge of the James Webb and they literally said it's, it's still all up in the air. They don't know what they're going to be observing first but um that dwarf star is definitely in the top 10 and they confirmed to me so quite an interesting one that one uh, the white dwarf opportunity paper uh, was written by Marsan colonists it's possible to find earth-like planets around white dwarfs yeah because what they're going to do is observe white dwarf stars and the possibility of planets still being able to survive even in such essentially low low light low heat and everything else um because they were surprised that they actually found a planet so close to a white dwarf star because in theory it should have been possibly wiped out or but it looks like it might have just been gradually pulled in as the uh the star died so we've got a uh, starlink uh Launch just happened uh, the other day. Launch number seven, landing number seven, I believe, that on that one. Yeah, it was great to see the Starlink booster land for the seventh time. A new record. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And chasing that, I think the first milestone for SpaceX to get to 10 launch and landings under their wing. And then they'll proceed to, if they want to push it beyond that, or retire at the boosters at uh, 10 launches. Yeah, that's the goal. And um, a lot of news come from down from Boca Chica as well. Um, like As we recalled this episode, obviously, uh, SN8's doing another static fire with the engine change and everything. And hopefully, what are you expecting to happen this, this uh, well, after the weekend, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, with the hop? What's your bets? Well, I really hope it's going to be next week. And let's say, I hope, or I predict it will be happen on the 3rd of December. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be the last day, and it? It, it, so, it always seems to be the important tests to do. Use the first two days to do the wet dress rehearsals, do the engine tests, and then on the last day go for that flight or hop, if you like. Uh, be absolutely incredible to see. I'll be watching from home or sneakily watching it at work, wherever I, I'll be. But uh, I'll be absolutely freaking out if that thing lands. <laughs> me too and i will be watching it whatever the time it's going to launch even if it's 4 a.m of course you're working working from home aren't you and everything so during this crazy crazy time i'm, I'm still having to be dredged into work unfortunately as well as uh running the podcast and everything but uh gotta do what you gotta do <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely and does anyone listening in to the podcast? We've got a little audience here. Um, if you guys listening in don't know, we have uh, got a few guys, Patreon lis listeners listening in here. Um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat now. The first question there by our Patreon listener, Susie. When will they be ready for the market? Um, I believe there's already payloads on the Astro Rocket. The next one's going to be launching. They have some US Army payloads or something. That's right, yeah. Yeah, because the Astro is very much um, funded by the uh, military. Yeah. Right, Miko, I think we'll wrap it things up there. Uh, thanks for joining us again today, guys. A big thank you to everyone who's su subscribed over on YouTube and to you guys listening at home, in your car, or wherever you may be. Thank you so much. Catch you next week, and have an awesome day. I've been Mikko, the host of Deep Dive Fridays. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, and if you like what we do, 
follow us on Patreon at patreon.com slash totalspace.